Good day, everyone. Welcome to our series of personality video lecture. My name is Genesis, and for today's lecture, I am utilizing Five and Five and Hall and Lindsay books as our text resources. So before we formally begin, just some important points to consider for TOP. TOP has a relative weight over other subjects like abnormal psychology and, and, and IO because they cover the same percentage, which is 20% of the total number of items in the upcoming board exam. So it tells us that we really need to be familiar to the different um, theories of personality, be acquainted to some of the important tenets of every theory. And just a simple tip, we need to also know a brief um, personal background of every theory so that we could be able to remember basic principles and attributes of their personal experiences into their respective personality theories. So let's begin. So first things first, let's define what personality is. So if you look into different um, textbooks, um, there is no single definition about personality. Some theories do not really define personality. In fact, Freud psychoanalysis is an example of such a theory. But there are books uh, which attempted to also come up with a definition for personality. We found these definitions, like uh, personality is defined as the dynamic organization of psychological systems residing in an individual. Another text also said that it is a sum total of reinforcements and punishment. Feist and Feist's definition of um, personality also put the words into this manner, that um, personality is a pattern of relatively permanent traits and unique characteristics that give both a consistency and individuality to a person's behavior. Moving on, um, let's define what the what a theory is all about. So a theory is a set of related assumptions that allow scientists to use logical deduct deductive reasoning to formulate testable hypotheses. Now on this part, we need to narrow down some important terminologies utilized to define what the theory is. So it is said that a theory is a set of assumptions. Now a single assumption can never fail all the requirements of an adequate theory. A single assumption too could not serve the um, integration of several observations which is something that a useful theory should do. Another is that it's not enough that it's just a set of assumptions, but it should be a set of related assumptions. It is because isolated assumptions can neither generate a meaningful hypothesis or possess an internal consistency. Another thing is that it should be assumptions, which constitutes a good theory. Although validity of these assumptions are not yet fully established, but they are accepted as if they are true. And this is a practical step taken by the scientists so that they could conduct a useful research and the results of which um, would continue to build and reshape the original theory. The fourth keyword is logical deductive reasoning, meaning to say it starts with a general theory and we arrive at a particular hypothesis. In formulating a particular theory of personality, the tenets of the theory must be stated with um, sufficient precision and logical consistency to permit scientists to deduce clearly stated hypotheses. So it is the job of an imaginative scientist to begin with the general theory and uh, through deductive reasoning, we arrive or they arrive at a particular hypothesis that can be tested. The final keyword is 
testable. So it means that a theory may not be immediately tested, but it must suggest the possibility that scientists in the future might develop the necessary means to test it. So it's not just enough enough that a theory is a good one, but it should also be a useful theory. So we also have a criteria of a useful theory. So one criterion is that a useful theory generates research. So if a useful theory generates um, research, it means that it also will generate many hypotheses that may reshape or enlarge a particular theory. Second criterion is falsifiable, meaning a theory could be evaluated based on the ability to be confirmed or disconfirmed. To be falsifiable, a theory must uh, be precise enough to suggest research that may either support or fail to support it's a major tenet so if a theory just like um, Freud psychoanalysis is so vague and nebulous that both positive and negative research results can be interpreted as support then that theory is not falsifiable and ceases to be useful. But then again, the tenets of um, psychoanalysis are still accepted up until this time because it's a classic and it's one of the most famous personality theories. The third criteria is a useful theory organized data. Without some organization or classification, a research finding would remain isolated and meaningless unless data are organized into some intelligible framework. Scientists are left with no clear direction to follow in the pursuit of further knowledge. It means to say that the group of data and research findings must be compatible with, with each other. The fourth criterion is it guides action. A good theory provides a structure for finding many answers. And without a useful theory, practitioners, researchers would stumble in the darkness of trial and error techniques with a sound theoretical orientation, they can discern a suitable course of action. So a good theory must guide the practitioner over the rough course of day-to-day -day problem, so to speak. The fifth criterion is a good and a useful theory is internally consistent. It doesn't have to be consistent with another theory but a theory must be internally consistent within itself. An internally consistent theory is one whose components are logically compatible. Last but not the least, the sixth criterion is a, a useful theory must be parsimonious. In building um, a theory of personality, psychologists should begin on a limited scale and avoid sweeping generalizations that attempt to explain all of human behavior. It tells us that a useful theory is simpler than complicated. Just like how Freud started with his cases of hysterical neurosis until all of his experiences eventually paved way for him to gradually expand his tenets until it became a total personality sphere. At this point, let's talk about 
Freud psychoanalysis, which is the most famous theory amongst all theories of personality. So just a brief background about Sigmund Freud. He was born um, not surely if it's March 6 or May 6 in 1856. What is certain is that he was born in Freiburg, Moravia. He died of mouth cancer or morphine overdose on September 23, 1939. He dreamt of becoming um, a neuro a neurologist, but uh, because of some financial challenges, he went out of school and decided to explore and learn some of the techniques in treating patients by some of his friends and acquaintances. So when he traveled to Paris, he learned about hysteria from John Martin Charcot, and he learned about the hypnotic technique to treat hysteria. So hysteria back in the days was considered as a disorder, uh, which is a paralysis or the improper functioning of certain body parts. So we could say that hysteria back in the days could be an equivalent of a conversion disorder. And Freud utilized his knowledge on hypnosis to treat his patients. But to some extent, Freud also got frustrated because um, he soon realized that not all patients could be hypnotized. Another important term that we need to be reminded of is catharsis. It is the removing of the hysterical symptoms by talking them out. In the recent time, it could be equivalent to the term abreaction. So it's like a cleansing effect wherein people are encouraged to pour their repressed emotions and get themselves um, relieved of these negative emotions, affect, or behaviors associated with unacknowledged un um, trauma or bad experience. Um, Freud psychoanalysis was actually created not to create a theory of personality, but it was his own way to attack structuralism, which was also found by or founded by Wilhelm Wundt. Just a background, structuralism was a school of psychology which attempted to analyze the the adult mind in terms of the simplest definable components and then to find how these components fit together to form more complex experiences as well as how they correlate to physical events. So to do this, um, psychologists in the past employ introspection or self-reflection, self-reports of sensations, they need to note them. Um, they also need to record on uh, their personal views, their feelings and emotions. And Freud at the time was against um, that, the tenets of um, structuralism. Uh, he opted to write a paper against the school of thought, which was also gaining popularity because of Wilhelm Wundt. Psychoanalysis was also intended to be just a theory of neurosis. As you can see, Freud was very interested to study about neurosis, which he believed that the root um, cause was actually child um, seduction by a parent, which is also uh, pretty much present in his stages of development or the psychosexual stages of development of psychoanalysis. And the third tenet is that all psychopathology can be traced back to sexual conflict. And this is actually a statement that 
some of the neo Freudians did not accept as they also tried to formulate their own personality theory to rectify some of the sexual tenets of Freud's psychoanalysis. And Freud himself didn't say that sex is the primary uh, motivation for contact, but he was certain that it was sexual instinct which has a strong influence on personality. And we know that an instinct in its psychological form is a form of wish and such a wish could be translated physiologically as a need which causes tension and we will discuss more about it in the coming section. So some important concepts to remember under Freud psychoanalysis. He believed that neurosis is a state of mind characterized by overreaction to cope from internal conflicts or anxiety. And still, up until this time, we are using um, neurosis as a concept to um, describe irrational behavior and irrational belief. Psychosis is a, gro- a gross dis- distortion of a gross distortion of reality, meaning a person has totally lost a glimpse and touch of reality. So they say that neurotics build their castles and a psychotic believes that they own the castle and are into that castle now. And the psychologists would only be getting the rent. Another term is psychosomatic. It's a psychological component or psychological components cause um, somatic disturbance. So it could be translated um, just like what happens in a condition called conversion disorder, meaning a certain event, a traumatic event perhaps may cause a person to suffer from blindness or any form of somatic dysfunction. Somatopsychic um, is a concept where in uh, mental symptoms uh, are caused by bodily illnesses. Um, an example condition called illness anxiety could be the perfect um, and, and concrete example of somatopsychic um, concept. When a person has a family history of diabetes or um, hypertension, whenever they could uh, be experiencing such a symptoms in the right age, they get to be so anxious about having the medical problem, and they get to be so anxious about having the medical disease that they don't actually go to the doctor because they are afraid that it um, might be confirmed that they have such medical problem, but they keep on researching for the signs and symptoms over the internet. And this is actually when um, body complaints would start to be present and it affects our mental functioning. And since we are all psychology majors, we know pretty well that we are familiar to the levels of mental life. Um, we have the unconscious, the pre-conscious, the unconscious proper, and the conscious part of the mental life. So the unconscious contains the drives, the urges, or the instincts beyond awareness, but nevertheless um, motivate most of our words, our feelings, and our actions. So they say that it covers about 60% of our mental life. The pre-conscious contains those not conscious but can actually become conscious the moment we are to think about it. The unconscious proper could be the items not to be recovered to be conscious but they may appear through Freudian slips or parapraxis. 
uh, to avoid anxiety. They say that uh, those Freudian slips or parapraxis are good elements in disguise that the that the primary sensor was not able to successfully stop from unveiling, and that's why they continue to be present in the conscious level through forms of slips or in forms of dreams where people become defensive because these are thoughts or images that are camouflaged and greatly distorted and sometimes it causes people anxiety that we begin to be defensive about it. So the conscious level of mental life, the, uh, they compose the mental elements in awareness at any given point in time. So some salient points to summarize Freud's um, theory. If there's um, the conscious mental life, we also have um, the unconscious level of mental life. Um, if you can't remember something, does it mean that it does not exist? So in the unconscious level, we know pretty well that these memories, these images and representations are still evident. Our source of motivation, according to Freud, is usually unconscious. And he proposed that there are no such things as accidents. There's always a motivation for something. Just like um, with chiropractic or Freudian slips, there's always a motivation behind uh, mispronouncing words, calling out the wrong name, or not just with um, Freudian slips, but also with the things that we do like going to school, having to receive certain achievements, always have an underlying motivation, which could be sexual in nature, according to Freud. Another is um, the psychology of errors or psychological slips, Freudian slips, or chiropractic. Some examples of the, these chiropractic may actually be a husband sending a letter to the wife, while he is having a vacation and enjoying his vacation somewhere in another country, he accidentally sent um, a text message or a letter saying that I am having a good time here and I wish you were her instead of I wish you were here or a friend of mine when we were facilitating an activity and he was the one who gave the exercise or a game called um, moon ball. And when he was the one giving the instructions, he accidentally said um, moon ball instead of saying moon ball. So let's go over the provinces or the topography of the mind. The instinct is psychoanalytically defined as a psychological representation of the inner somatic excitation. So as, men as mentioned a while ago, I said that an instinct psychological representation is a wish. So in other words, instincts are considered, therefore, to be uh, propelling factors of personality. Now, an instinct has um, four characteristics um, features. Now, the impetus is actually the force or the strength of an instinct. Like, for example, when a person uh, is hungry, the intensity of the underlying need is actually the impetus. And the source is the region of the body, which is, the, which is now in the state of excitation or tension. So when a person is hungry, the source could be the stomach. The aim um, seeks pleasure by removing 
excitation or reducing tension. So it means that the aim is the removal of the bodily excitation or tension. So in the case of our example, a person who is hungry is a person who would seek to remove um, that tension he or she is experiencing inside his stomach. So the aim of the person who is hungry is to also abolish um, nutritional deficiency. Now the object is a person or a thing serving as means through which the aim is satisfied. But in some other texts, um, they say that it's not just a mere person or thing, but it, it also includes the behavior that takes place in securing the necessary thing or condition, meaning to say eating is not a person or a thing, but when a person eats, it is also the process wherein it alleviates the person's hunger. It alleviates the tension that is experienced by the person. And eating could be an object in this manner when we talk about the four characterizations of instinct. Now, Freud in his theory conceptualized aggression and sex to be the cornerstones of motivation. And these two are examples of instinct. Aggression is a destructive drive that aims to return the organism to its organic, inorganic state. While sex, um, its aim is pleasure and not just limited to genital, genital satisfaction. So just like what we learned in physics, sorry for the rumbled letter, but it meant that psychic energy can't be created, created nor destroyed, and it can only be transformed. So just like energy. Now Freud believed that the it, is the reservoir of all psychic energy. In fact, he stated that the id is the true psychic personality. As the region that houses the basic drives, the id operates through the primary process, which is the free, uninhibited flow of psychic energy from one idea to another. And the id operates in this banner because it blindly seeks to satisfy the pleasure principle. Its survival is dependent on the development of the secondary process to bring into contact with the external world. And talking about this dependency, meaning to say the id is dependent with the ego. Now, the ego comes to existence in order to forward the aims of the id. Its power derives from the id. And we know that it's the only entity that functions in reality testing. Secondary process is likely to... The secondary process is likely to function in the ego because it is the only entity which is rational, effective, um in its ways in meeting internal instinct demands and also external environmental demands. Also, the ego mediates between the organism's instinct, instinctual requirements and conditions of surrounding environment. It has its sense of identifying and it functions in reality principle compared to the id, which is about pleasure and satisfaction. Now, the superego is the internal representative of traditional values and ideals of society as interpreted to the child by the parents or the caregivers and informs by means of rewards and punishment. And we know for a fact that the superego is not evident and present until the child is about five or six years old. The particular entity strives for perfection. Um, it prefers ideal rather than real. It's 
moralistic and also has an idealistic principle. It attempts to control over instincts, unlike the ego. Doesn't postpone instinctual gratification, but it tries to block the instinctual gratification completely. It is because um, the super ego contains our conscience, and it also has the ego ideal. The conscience um, it results from the experiences with uh, the punishments from improper behavior. And guilt is also in function. Uh, while the ego ideal, it develops from our experiences with rewards for proper behavior. And it also stems uh, from inferiority feeling. Now, some important concepts of Freud psychoanalysis include cathexis. Effective is an investment of energy in an object such as a wish, a fantasy, a person, or a goal. Effective is also described as a an instinctual drive or driving forces. So let's say, for example, a person who is hungry would likely be doing anything just to satisfy uh, himself from his or her hunger. So, cathexis could be any invested energy uh, for a particular wish, fantasy, or a goal, or even a person. And another example would be an ego cathexis. When a person would be hungry, uh, it doesn't really follow that the ego cathexis uh, talks about um, the person's satisfaction to eat, but it may actually be invested on other related um, concepts. Like, for example, um, a restaurant, um, a particular food. So these are examples of cathexis. And the object cathexis is an investment of the libido in objects outside of the self, like a person, a goal, an idea, or an activity. And our first um, object defective back when we were still an infant was basically our parents or our nurturers. Now, the psychoanalytic theory focuses on the influence of the unconscious forces on the mental life and the adjustment of the individual. And according to Freud, personality development happens during the first of five to six years of life in response to four major sources of tension. The following are physiological growth causes, frustrations, conflicts, and threats. And basically, these are the four um, major sources of tension uh, that could also be found in the psychosexual stages uh, made by Freud himself. Some important concepts of Freud's psychoanalysis include identification. It's a method by which a person takes over the feature of another person and may than part of their own personality. So it could be observed also by seeing a child trying to incorporate some of the um, important uh, features, uh, traits, characteristics of his own father unto himself. And identification also is a process in the phallic stage of um, Freud's psychosexual stages. Or in a male child would be able to also identify his own sexuality through identifying with the male parent. Moving on, displacement is um, an or when an original object of choice of an instinct is rendered. Sorry for the wrong text. It's rendered inaccessible by external or internal barriers of a new cathexis or when a new cathexis is formed. So it means that there are numerous displacements that uh, became a discharge tension 
acting as a permanent motivating force for a particular behavior. So it means to say that a person is constantly seeking new and better ways of reducing tension. And this accounts for the variability and the diversity of behavior as well as for the human restlessness. On the other hand, the personality does become more or less stabilized with age due to the compromises that are made between the urging forces of the instincts and the resistances of the ego and the superego. So in other words, as we grow older, we begin to have a more stabilized personality compared to our younger years when we keep on displacing and constantly finding better ways of um, reducing tension. And in this way, we could somehow simply say that a person back in the younger years would likely be showing signs of immaturity compared to an adult which has also a more stabilized um, personality. So according to Freud's um, psychoanalysis, if psychic energy were not displaceable, as mentioned earlier, there would be no personality development. Now, anxiety, according to Freud, they are present to warn the person to uh, about an impending danger, and they are signals to the ego that appropriate measures are to be taken or the danger, the perceived danger may increase and the ego could be overthrown. Now we have three kinds of anxiety. One is the neurotic anxiety which is an apprehension about an unknown danger. Now neurotic anxiety could be present when we are facing our parents our teacher or an employer only because we had experienced unconscious feelings of destruction against these kinds of individuals. Second um, type of anxiety is moral anxiety. Uh, it is about the conflict between the ego and the superego. So moral anxiety could likely be present when there is a fail, uh, there is failure as a result uh, to behave consistently with what they regard as morally right, or failing to perform what is morally and socially acceptable. The third type or category of anxiety is realistic anxiety. It is the fear of real dangers in the external world. It is also termed as an objective danger because it is um, a form of fear that we normally experience in novel experiences. Let's say, for example, um, Realistic anxiety could be present while you are driving in a heavy, fast-moving traffic in an unfamiliar city, um, uh, a situation that is real and we have an objective um, fear and likely danger that we are perceiving. And finally, we have come to uh, the part of Freud's defense uh, mechanism. So this will just be a simple run-through of uh, Freud's defense mechanism. So defense mechanisms are extreme measures to relieve uh, the person from experiencing pressure from anxiety. And that's why we are prone to deny, falsify, or distort reality. Uh, which actually operates um, unconsciously or usually it is um, or we are unconscious whenever we are also utilizing defense mechanisms. 
uh, repression is the most basic de uh, defense mechanism. It excludes uh, painful experiences and acceptable impulses from consciousness. Sometimes we term it as a motivated forgetting. Reaction formation is a form of defense mechanism wherein an acceptable or threatening unconscious impulses are denied and replaced in consciousness with their opposite. So this is when um, we have a particular experience with our parents and sometimes we get to also act differently even if it or what they are asking us to do is totally against our will. We tend to perform it and sometimes we get to obey them and show the appropriate behavior even if we are also against um, what they wanted us to perform or what they wanted us to do. Displacement is um, a redirection of unacceptable urges to people or objects. So original impulse is disguised or failed, meaning we try to rechannel uh, the input of our urges because um, the person who caused us anxiety is actually an authority figure and more powerful than us that we channel such urge to another person or a thing which is likely perceived to be less powerful than us. Fixation is the permanent attachment of libido onto earlier, more primitive stages of development. And fixation is evident in the psychosexual stages of development. Regression is reverting back to earlier developmental stage. Uh, one example of regression is when a husband who fought with a, with a wife would suddenly go home to his parents in order to save his ego. Projection is seeing in others unacceptable feelings or tendencies that actually reside in one's unconscious. Introjection is incorporating positive qualities of another person into their own ego. Like idolizing someone and they eventually begin to believe that they are also having those positive qualities of uh, someone they idolize as if it's also their own personality. Next is sublimation. It's the repression of the genital aim of the eros by substituting a cultural or a social aim. An example of which is when a child who used to be a bully back in his childhood years would decide to join the army and decided to also thwart and channel the, in, the impulse or the urge to hit someone and they decided to channel it in a more or social, uh, more a more socially acceptable behavior. 